on behalf of all of us present here today, offering our most loving, humble pranams at the lotus feet to our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Sheshang Shah. Very fortunate to have him here with us. And thank you all for making the time to come ahead and be present and listen to Swami's glory. It's my privilege to say, to introduce him to you this morning. Dr. Sheshang Shah is an eminent researcher in the field of corporate responsibility and stakeholder management strategy with noteworthy contributions through original ideas and pioneering analysis to his credit. He completed his PhD and postdoctoral research in the area of corporate stakeholders management at the Sri Satyasai Institute of Higher Learning in Prashantinilayam. Bhagwan Sri Satyasai Baba awarded him the Governor's Gold Medal for standing first at the Master of Philosophy program in Business Management in 2006 and the President of India Gold Medal for standing first at the MBA program at the Sri Satyasai University in 2004. As the Chief Editor and Coordinator of the Sri Satyasai University's Publication Division for more than six years, he has compiled and edited over 30 books on the message of the Reverend Founder Chancellor Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba. I have sent the bio to all of you, so I will not uh, continue on with the number of books that he's written. So in between 2012 and 2014, he served as the Joint Secretary and the Treasurer of the Sri Satya Sai Students and Staff Welfare Society at Prashantinilayam. And between 2002 and 2010, Dr. Sheshank was blessed by Swami to address large gatherings of students, youth and Sai devotees on over 25 occasions at Prashantinilayam, Brindavan, youth and Sai devotees on over 25 occasions at, uh, at the Prashantinilayam. Over the last 15 years, he has addressed youth conference of Sri Satya Sai Seva organizations from the states of Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Gujarat and Rajasthan. And between 2005 and 2015, he was a keynote speaker at the World Youth Conference, All India Chancellors, Conference, All India Balavikas, Alumni Conference, All India Conference of District President and Senior Senior Office Bearers, etc. Since 2015, he has been the keynote speaker at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Conference, Region 2, Pacific South Region Conference, Region 8, Region 3, Region 10, Region 4. As you can see, he's addressed almost nine regions out of the 10 regions of the US. From 1999 to 2002, Dr. Sheshang Shah was a member of the Youth Wing, Sri Satya Sai Seva Organizations, Mumbai, and actively associated with the Education and Human Values Program of the Institute of Satya Sai Education, Mumbai. From 2014, Dr. Sheshang Shah has been visiting scholar at the Harvard Business School and held joint upon appointments as a project director and fellow at the Harvard University South Asia Institute. He also served as the editor-in-chief of the Postdoctoral Editors Association, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Harvard University, and is currently consulting editor at the Business India Group. His forthcoming book on the 150th anniversary of the Tata Group of Companies is being published by the Penguin Random House in October 2018. Above all, he is blessed to be from a member of Sai devotees from the year 1965 when his great-grandmother first visited Prashantinilayam. In the year 1974, Swami physically visited his family residence in Mumbai. Such an distinguished, dis, distinguished, I think extinguished, distinguished, distinguished, esteemed scholar is present with us this, after, this morning and we are so fortunate and blessed to be in his presence and listen to his uh, experiences and his teachings that he learned at the Divine Lotus Feet. So please join me in giving him a loving, warm welcome, Dr. Sheshang Shah. Offering our loving pranams at uh, Swami's Divine Lotus Feet. Uh, a very warm good morning to all of you as well. And uh, happy Dipavali in advance. Uh, this is the Dipavali celebrations week. And uh, it's such an important festival for all of us. It has a great spiritual significance. While we also enjoy all the sweets, burning of crackers, wearing new clothes and getting together. And uh, sharing our mutual warmth and love. Uh, we go to the year 90, uh, 1999. It was the 74th birthday celebrations. Swami was giving darshan in the Sai Kulwant Hall. 
and uh, of course it was the birthday celebration so there were so many devotees in the Sai Kulwant hall and Swami had taken letters from so many devotees you know when Swami and the birthday celebrations are on everybody wants to either wish Swami or express their gratitude or have their long list of prayers so all of them so many of them had given letters to Swami and Swami's hands were full of letters so Swami uh, was moving in the veranda with both his hands full of letters. So one of the devotees looked at Swami and Swami said, uh, and, and uh, that devotee told Swami, Swami, so many devotees have come for your birthday celebrations. So many devotees have offered letters to you, Swami. Both your hands are full. So Swami said, yes. He looked at uh, that devotee, saw the two uh, showed his two hands full and then he repeated that statement from uh, from that famous uh, nursery rhyme Baba Black Sheep. Swami said two hands full, two hands full. You know that uh, second sentence Baba Black Sheep have you any wool? That, that one in that two bags full. So Swami said two hands full, two hands full. And then immediately from that nursery rhyme it went into a, such an impacting message. Swami said, two hands full, but I am not the black sheep. I am the white ship which has come to take mankind across to the other shore of divinity. Such a powerful message, such an important message about the role that Swami has come to play in our lives. And if Swami is a role model, I thought it would be important to elaborate on this word which Swami used, ship. How he is, he is a white ship which has come to take us all across and how we need to make the most of this ship so that we may cross this ocean of life and death. Uh, another important uh, analogy which would be worthwhile mentioning here would be what we celebrated at the Avatar Declaration Day. The bhajan with which Swami started his avatar hood on 1940, 20th October, Manas Bhajare Guru Charanam, Dustara Bhavasagara Taranam. We sing that with all enthusiasm. We think it's a veneration of the Guru's feet. But Swami has said that that bhajan has a very distinct message. And the message of that bhajan can be understood in the reverse order. And what is the reverse order? First, realize that you are in a Bhavasagara. That you are living through these innumerable waves which are each equivalent to a lifetime. Innumerable waves symbolize innumerable lifetimes. So you are in the Bhavasagara. That is the first realization that you need to have. The second realization is that you want to cross this Bhavasagara. That you want to do Taranam or you want to cross it. How do you cross this? For that you need a Guru to provide you the direction. That's why Swami said, I am the white ship which will help you cross this ocean to the other side of divinity. And having found that Guru, you have to worship his feet. Worshipping his feet does not mean worshipping his picture which has his feet or worshipping his feet physically through flowers and uh, water and, uh, and tulsi or bilva leaves. Worshipping his feet symbolizes following the path that he has shown by action. Walking the path that the master has shown is worshipping his feet. That is the true meaning of Manas Bhajare Guru Charanam Dustara Bhavasagara Taranam. I think every time we sing this bhajan, we need to reflect on this important message that Swami has given so that we are able to recalibrate our spiritual journey and move in the direction in which Swami wants us to move. Move in the direction by benefiting of the opportunity of Him having come into our lives, having intervened in our lives, having shown us a direction and then having told us that don't walk in front of me, I may not follow you. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead you. Walk beside me and be my friend. He wants us to be his friend. Walk beside him because he, is, he will hold our hand and take us to our destination. So in this context, let's see what this ship has to teach us as a role model. So I have divided this word ship into four alphabets and I'd attempt to elaborate on each of them and see what we can learn from Swami's life. 
the first s and the most important part of swami's life is this word which we rarely reflect on but which is the core of what swami has shown in action is sacrifice swami's life has been one of total sacrifice and that's why swami always used to repeat that if there is anything which will confer on us liberalize liberation self realization that is sacrifice na karmana na prajaya dhanena tyage naike amrutatva manasu neither by wealth nor by progeny nor by actions alone can one attain the supreme liberation the state of liberation it is only by sacrifice sacrificing what and sacrificing how is what i'd like to emphasize on so first let us see what swami did because the theme is swami as a role model i'll keep referring to how swami did what he did and what we can learn from swami both physically and spiritually if we see swami's life itself from dawn to dusk every single day if we just analyze the kind of work that swami has done in his 85 years of lifetime every single day is an action packed day there is no day when he has a sunday or a holiday like uh, dr suhasini mentioned thank you so much for coming early today because we have an extinguished speaker <laughs> we have never ever thanked swami to say that thank you swami for having come today for darshan every single day swami has come for darshan both morning evening darshan bhajan interview darshan bhajan interview whether he was 25 or whether he was 85 we are looking for opportunities to take rest swami never took any rest we know that very well but the problem is whenever we met swami we never told him how happy we were how lucky we were how grateful we were for having him in our lives we always told swami swami my daughter's marriage swami my son's promotion swami my grandson's naming ceremony then interesting incident one devotee told swami swami i want to know the path to self realization so swami swami said yes yes definitely tomorrow i will tell you i will give you interview in the morning i'll give you the path to self realization so this devotee said no no swami tomorrow morning is my grandson's upanayanam ceremony i can't come we'll do the interview day after <laughs> so that's the kind of priority we've made swami an atm machine you put your card of a prayer and you expect that the money will come out i guess that's how swami has been sometimes even used to our advantage and he let himself be used because he had come to offer himself to us but what is it that we learn from that that his life has been one of sacrifice i did a rough calculation about how many interviews swami would have given in his 50 years swami would have given nearly 100000 personal interviews 100000 personal interviews and in each interview there were about 20 people at least on an average because most of them were group interviews which means swami has personally given interviews to 2 million people in his lifetime entire life for the sake of others and everybody comes and pours out their woes and swami always gives them solace nothing everything will be fine everything will be fine you are divine you will be divine see that inspiration and that sense of support that he provided what can we learn from that in our lives because we have so many people coming out and pouring their woes to us but we'll always tell them give me a break i have my own worries to worry about why are you harassing me can we be more supportive empathetic and encouraging like swami was to us throughout his life swami's life was one of sacrifice because he lived an extremely simple life very few know between 1950 and 1993 for the 43 years when swami stayed upstairs above the prashantale mandir from the age 25 to the age 68 swami had a small room of the size of 8 by 10 feet 8 by 10 feet with a wooden cot with a wooden chair with a wooden table with a wooden cupboard with a simple 4 by 10 bathroom of which the first quarter century was an indian wc with a small lamp inside with one fan no air condition with water not even coming in the taps in the first 10 15 years 
Water used to be brought from downstairs. There was no geyser for the first half of those 20, uh, 43 years, about 20, 25 years. So you see the kind of life Swami has lived has been one of extreme sacrifice and frugality. We are always in the, this is the most affluent country in the world. It prides itself in being the leader of the developed world. And we have all the facilities available at our beck and call. 24 by 7, we have water in our bathrooms. Our problems are of a different kind. Which dress should I wear Did this Deepavali? Because I already wore this sari last year. Which earring should I wear for this year's Dandiya Gar Garba program? Because I have already worn this last year. Mom, I need a new pair of earrings. You see the kind of example that Swami set before us of simplicity and of humility by practicing all of this. And then Swami used to say that I am telling you what I am telling you because I have lived through myself. Swami used to tell the students I am telling you to live a simple life because I have myself lived a simple life. When I was a student I used to go to school. I had only two pairs of uniforms Swami told us in one of the discourses. In that one I used to wear and one other one used to be for washing. I used to myself wash it, hang it. And then next day, before going to school, I used to take a cloth in which I used to put, no, I used to take a vessel in which I used to put the burning coal. And that was my iron. And with that, I used to iron my clothes. And when the clothes used to tear, I used to take thorns and put it in that so that I can go to school without the torn shirt. That is the kind of simplicity and sacrifice, life of sacrifice that Swami has lived. If we really want inspiration as side devotees from Swami, we need not just look at the grandiose institutions and edifices that Swami has constructed in the form of these wonderful hospitals and these grand ashrams, but also the simplicity that Swami displayed and lived throughout his personal life. The other thing connected with sacrifice is that of what is the inner meaning of sacrifice? The inner meaning of sacrifice, we always, the external meaning we always take as giving up something. We go to Tirupati and shave our head and come back. Swami always used to say, Lord Venkateshwara does not need your dirty hair. He has his own beautiful locks. Giving up your hair in Tirupati is symbolic of giving up your vices. Some bad quality. Give up something bad and come so that over several pilgrimages. And then you are mandated to go for pilgrimage every year. You see how the scriptures have planned. You go there, give up one voice, go every year, give up one voice. Over half a century, you become a much better individual. And that's the case with every religion. That's the case with every temple. But we try to bring it down to some symbolism and try to escape and be the way we are because we are happy the way we are. The easiest thing is you are God. I am your devotee, you are great, I am not, to err is human, to forgive is divine, so I will continue to make mistakes, you will continue to forgive me, I will continue to sing your glory and everything will be fine. How nicely we have worked out the formula of our life so that we don't need to change. But the whole objective of spirituality is to change. S-A-I, Swami always used to say, S stands for spiritual change. A stands for associational change. I stands for individual change. This is karma, this is jnana, bhakti and karma. You need to have spiritual change which is related to the path of jnana. You need to have associational change which is related to the path of bhakti. You need to have individual change which is to do with the path of karma. And this is the core message of Swami's life. So we need to sacrifice these wrong notions that we have and live up to the true meaning of what sacrifice is all about. There's a very nice Chinnakatha that Swami had once shared. There was this student and because there are some Y's here, there was a student who promised to God that if I clear my mathematics exam, I will make very nice Chakra Pongal and offer to you in the altar. You know what is Chakra Pongal? It is sweet Pongal. It's a South Indian dish. So he said, if I clear my mathematics paper, I will give Chakra Pongal. This story Swami has himself narrated. So he said, after exams, first thing I'll go and make it for you. So he came into the examination hall. He saw his maths paper. He said, uh, paper is easy. He started making a cost sheet on Chakra Pongal. What all things I will need parallelly. And as he realized that the paper is easy, he started reducing one one item from the Chakra Pongal making dish. Finally, by the time he had completed the paper, he realized that all the questions are easy. I have been able to attempt all of them. So at the end, he said, why all this Chakra Pongal cancel? Why does God need Chakra Pongal? I will give water to him. Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam. Toyam is what I will give him. So he said, I'll take a glass of water and offer it to God in the altar. 
with that great thought he went back home he told he met his father his father said how was your examination so he said great dad it was great he said can i see your question paper so he said yes i will show you my question paper so when he opened his bag and removed the question paper he looked at it and he shouted out god has cheated me so this, so his father worried what happened when he went back uh, to, when he went to his room he, he said what happened he said no and then he told the whole story it emerged that in his excitement of saving the money on chakrapongal and giving water to god he went and gave the cost sheet of making chakrapongal to his teacher and brought the answer paper home and that's why he screeched out that god has cheated me and then his father told him god has not cheated you you tried to deceive god by your artificial sense of sacrifice and you have cheated your own self you have deceived your own self nobody has deceived you so that is the kind of sacrifice we try to make so i always used to say what is that god wants in the bhagavad gita four things are mentioned put patram pushpam phalam toyam i just mentioned what is patram we think offering bilwa leaves tulsi leaves and so many other different kinds of leaves which are growing on trees is what god wants as an offering that's why our altars are so beautiful you go to temples they are full of all kinds of beautiful flowers and leaves available there but what is the meaning of patram patram does not mean that which grows on the trees patram means your body we have to offer a pure unsullied body to god in his service in his work all throughout our life the problem is we offer ourselves to the world first and when the world no longer wants us we offer ourselves to god that's why it is very conveniently planned that devotion is for retirement why because by then job is over kids are educated you are almost ready to be sent to the old age home and when nobody wants you say i have offered myself to god that's not the time to offer ourselves to god when our skills talents capabilities knowledge able everything is available to be offered in its fullness that's when we have to offer ourselves to god and say this life is for you while i discharge all my duties with all focus my heart is for you so that is patram what is pushpam pushpam is the heart hridaya pushpam you have to offer we must offer our heart our pure unsullied heart to god that's why swami always used to give the example the human heart has become a musical chair when you are a kid friends sit on it in alternation when you grow up the fairer gender sits on it in alternation when you still grow up your kids sit there in alternation when the kids grow up the bosses sit there in alternation because you want promotion there is no place for god in the heart the god has to be a, the chair heart has to be a single chair sofa where god resides sits all the time that is the purpose of hridaya pushpam we need to offer the flower of the heart next fruit phalam mano phalam the fruit of the mind the mind is full of all kinds of ideas now very often we misunderstand the mind one old lady once came to swami and said swami my mind is troubling me please help me swami said yes instantly i will help you plus tell me where your mind is give it to me and i will solve your problem and then that lady devotee kept quiet because where is the mind have we ever analyzed this we keep giving so much importance i have mental problems mental stress mental anxiety everything is mental but where is the mind so i always used to give the example of the kerchief it took me 10 years to understand every time during the sis course i will remove the kerchief and show what is this kerchief what is it made of threads what are the threads made of cotton so cotton is the basis of the thread and thread is the basis of the kerchief correct similarly thoughts are the basis of which desires are the threads of which mind is a conglomeration you have all these thread thoughts which lead to desires and all these desires are the warp and woof which keep on weaving itself into the mind and that mind keeps becoming expanded and complicated as we keep growing because more and more desires more and more thoughts and as much junk goes in that much more the mind becomes complicated we always think that the mind is 
very limited in capacity. Professor Kasturi Rangan, who is the former chairman of Indian Space Research Organization, had once come to Puttaparthi in the, to address the convocation as the chief guest. He said the human mind has as much storage capacity as the entire Facebook. All that is there on Facebook, by all accounts, in all countries, that much capacity a single human mind has. This is a scientist from Indian Space Research Organization telling. That is the capacity of the mind. That is the storage capacity which we have. But what is the problem? In information systems, they teach this to school children and even college students. There is a term called GIGO. GIGO means, anybody from the IT field here? Garbage. Exactly. Garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage inside the information system, you will get garbage out. Right? When I was in school, we had a poem that a person was asked to put together material on Gandhi. But what he got from the internet was, he was a very ferocious man. He captured so many kingdoms. He destroyed so many temples. So this man said, this doesn't match the description of what I have learned about Gandhi in school. So then the computer tells him, why did you type Gori instead of Gandhi? Because you typed Gori, you got the message on Gori and you thought you typed Gandhi. So we put garbage in, you get garbage out. We are constantly uploading garbage into this system. Our eyes, ears, nose, everything is an input device. Everything is storing garbage here. And that's why our actions, our words, our thoughts, everything is giving garbage. That is why when we purify our actions, our intentions, our priorities, everything else will automatically fall into place. So this is the kind of patram, pushpam, phalam and toyam is water. What is water? Not from the tap. Water from your heart, from your eyes, the joy, the bliss that you get when you feel that sense of love for God. That is the kind of offering that God wants. So this is the true sacrifice that we need to make in our lives. And this is what Swami did in his entire life to set an example. I'll tell you one experience about offering to God. This is my own experience. And Dr. Suhasini said I should share some of my own experiences also. I usually don't do that because it's not about me. It's about Swami and that's what the spotlight should be. It should be in the darker area. The spotlight should be on our master. That is the focus of every platform we get to talk about him. So this was when we were in our final year of MBA. We all students usually want to give some gift of gratitude to Swami. So some every batch tries to give something different. Someone I, I wouldn't like to get into those details. Whatever they think is relevant to them, they will give. So we thought that Swami has been wearing this orange robe all the time. He stopped wearing colored robes for festivals. He was not wearing yellow robe for Janmashtami. He was not wearing white for birthday. He was not wearing maroon for convocation. All of those things Swami had stopped wearing. So we thought we'll try and give him a reminder. That Swami, we want to see you in different kinds of robes, in different colors. So we put together three robes, or yellow, maroon and white. And put, packed it nicely with a set of letters from all the students who were graduating. I would have otherwise said passing out. But I realized after coming here that passing out means something else. <laughs> the first few years of my talks, I used to say I passed out from undergraduation. <laughs> then I would say I passed out from post-graduation. And people are laughing like this. And I'm wondering why are they laughing because I finished my studies. Then I realized, no, they're laughing because I said I passed out. Then I started saying, no, I graduated. You see how, how humorous language can be. One man's food is another man's poison, right? One man's graduation is another man's fainting. <laughs> so that's the kind of uh, gift we wanted to give Swami. We all sent all those letters and ropes to Swami and then Swami gave, uh, uh, Swami accepted all the letters at his residence and he said, I don't want these robes. Tell the students if they want robes, I will give them. So the students who had gone along with the warden, Professor Shivshankar Sai, to, the, uh, to Swami's residence came back and we were told that Swami said, we do, he doesn't want robes. If we want robes, he will give. So all of us senior students who were in that room that day on the third floor of the hostel were discussing why did Swami not accept our gift? He should at least know the genuine feelings of our heart. And then I said, if Swami says he wants to give a robe, let him give. We will give our parents so that they can keep it in the altar. So one of my friends said, why don't you go and tell Swami tomorrow in the mandir that you want a robe? 
Then I pointed out at Swami's picture in our hostel room. Every room has a picture of Swami. We make our own altar so that the room is like a temple where we are all staying. By the way, we are 12 to 14 boys staying in one room. That's the kind of community living Swami used to encourage. And that was the case across all classes, whether you are in first grade or in university. Everybody stays in a community. Each, particularly in each room, everybody is of a different language from a different part of India so that you do not have any opportunities for a smooth behavior. There will be conflict and from that conflict will emerge synergies and you will learn to live amicably with others. Now we have problems living with our own siblings. Imagine we are staying with 12 others in our room, those who don't even speak our language. So we were having this conversation. So I said, what is the need for going and for me going and telling Swami, here is this photograph. I'm telling Swami in the photograph, I want the robe. If you want to give, please give, we will give it to our parents, I said. And then the conversation ended, the bell rang, we went for dinner. For everything, there is a bell in the hostel. Dinner time, there will be bell, everybody will go down. In that 50 minutes, you don't go for your dinner. Your dinner counter will close, you get food only next day morning breakfast. No flexibility, it's not like here, My, uh, yeah, if you are late for food, mom will say, oh, no problem, I'll make cheese dosa for you. And then the kid will come at any time of the day and night and say, mom, I want cheese dosa and you will get cheese dosas at your dining table. So. Next day morning, Swami was coming back from the hospital and he stopped near the hostel and he told the warden that tell all the students to come home, uh, to come to uh, the mandir early today. Uh, that is my instruction. So the warden said, okay, Swami, we will all come early to mandir. So when Swami gives such instruction, it's either he wants to do some, he wants the students to participate in some activity or there is some distribution or something. So we went to mandir, there on the platform, there were... Le there were piles and piles of robes. The full platform where, so the veranda where Swam, the, the portico where Swami used to stand and give darshan was full of robes. Orange colored robes, so many of them. So we were all aghast, especially those from our room who were uh, discussing the previous day were aghast. As we sat down and settled down in the next 10 minutes, Swami started distribution of those robes. And after the robe distribution was over, I was sitting in the 10th row. Swami was standing in the portico, he looked at me from where he was standing and then smiled and nodded his head. From where I was sitting, I folded my hands and I also nodded my head because the conversation had happened in the room that why do I need to sell, tell Swami in person, I'm telling Swami he's here in this photograph that we want robes, please give. And instantly in 12 hours, not only me or my class or the, or the graduating batch, Almost 1,000 students from primary, uh, from higher secondary school, from the university and the staff members all were given ropes. So we came back to the hostel that day and all of us were chatting. They said, wow, what a great exposure, about a great experience. Swami listened to our prayers in the hostel room. You must narrate this when you give a talk again. So I said, okay, it's a great experience. I will narrate it. So this was in March 2004. In April 2004, we were all in Brindavan because the vacations were on. And we were uh, getting three sessions. Three sessions is when Swami calls the students inside Trai Brindavan. So we used to stay in the hostel. And that particular day, I got delayed for because of some reason. So the bhajans had already begun. You know how the bhajan hall is in Sai Ramesh Hall. Swami's residence, Trai Brindavan, is behind. The hostel is here. The Ramesh Hall is right in front. So you come from the hostel into the Sai Ramesh Hall and sit down. But you have to come before Swami comes onto the stage. Unlike Prashant Nilam, where we come from behind, even if Swami has come, we can come and sit behind. But here there is no behind, it's all in the front. So you have to come and sit before Swami comes onto the stage. So I had known that Swami has started from Trai. I dashed from the hostel, came and sat, and I just came and sat in the last row of the student's block, and the door opened. Swami came and he sat down there. I was sweating, panting, and Swami came and sat on the stage, and then he looked at me. So you are happy, Swami is looking at you. Again, he looked at me after a few seconds. And that entire bhajan session, Swami would have looked at me at least 20, 25 times. Now, when Swami looks at devotees, they are supremely delighted. Oh, wow, Swami is looking at me so many times. I would have done something wonderful. So Swami is sharing his, is showering his grace on me. When Swami keeps looking at students again and again, first they are very happy and after some time they get concerned that I have done something wrong. And these are looks of reminders that what have you done? 
So your mind starts going into your memory lanes and you are like exploring what all mistakes you made in the last several days that Swami wants you to reflect on. But I was not remembering as to what, I, I did make several mistakes like all of us do, but I didn't know which particular mistake was Swami unhappy with. So I was just uh, hoping that the bhajan session enters soon and I can go back to hostel so that I don't have to face Swami. But that day Swami decided to give a thrice session. And uh, usually we go in by classes, by which, whichever first year, second year. That day it was decided to pick up uh, the tokens. So the boy who was sitting in the first uh, row of my row, he picked up the token and he got row number one. So I ended up right in the fourth row inside the Trai Brindavan in front of Swami's Jula. So he came, he sat there and the first thing he did was he looked at me and he called me. So my birthday was there just a week prior to that. This was the 10th of April 2004. My birthday was just a week prior to that. And Swami uh, accepted my letter. I had written a letter to Swami. So in that I had written, Swami, today is my birthday. So Swami said, today is your birthday. I said, no, Swami, this is on the day my birthday. I couldn't give you a letter. That's why I'm holding it now. So that I thought I will give in, get a chance to give in Thrai Brindavan. So he said, oh, okay, very good, very good. Then he was asking me, what did you do on your birthday? What gift did your mother give you? And all of that conversation. After all of that was over, Swami said, okay, why don't you give a talk and address all the students here? So I said, okay, Swami. So then I started giving a talk. In the middle of my talk, I recollected that my classmates had said that I should talk about the robe experience whenever I talk the next time. So in my talk, I started narrating the robe experience. And after the talk was over, I narrated that and several other experiences. After the talk was over, Swami, even before I could sit down, Swami told the set of people sitting in front, he said, I knew this boy will talk about the robe. That's why before coming down, I have arranged all the robes for distribution to the Brindavan students and staff. They did not get the robes. Prashantinilam boys got the robes. I knew this boy will talk about the robes. If this boy talks about the robes, I knew all Brindavan and Prashant, Brindavan teachers and students will feel bad. So even before I came down, I made the, all the arrangements. So when uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar, who is the warden of Brindavan now, went up, he saw that outside Swami's room, all the robes were ready in piles. He decided that even before coming for bhajans. We think that we are doing things and we are offering things to Swami. We are only instruments. As the sister here who does the Riverside Seva, I told her you are doing such a great job for 18 years. Every single weekend you are offering food to the hungry. Whether snow shine, sunshine or no shine, you are there and doing that seva. She said, no, I'm not doing, I'm the instrument. But to be able to be used as an instrument also is divine grace. So we think that we are doing he is making it, he is getting it done through us. We, I will come up last, my row goes in first, I land up there, Swami calls me for giving talk, he knows I will talk about the robe and he knows the boys may feel bad and so before even coming down he decides that all these students should also get the robe so he plans the robe distribution and then uses me as the instrument. So that is the kind of willingness we should have if we want to be a befitting devotee. Krishna had told Arjuna on the battlefield, Nimitta Matram Bhavasavya Sachi, you have to be an instrument of Arjuna. You are not fighting this war. I am the one who is fighting this war. And then in that vision he shows, see all these great warriors are already dead. They have already given up their life. You are only being instrument to enable them to achieve their destiny. So think that you are an instrument of God and be ready to be used as an instrument of God. And Swami is to give the example of flute. We all put a beautiful flute on Krishna's hands and his lips. What is the symbolism of the fruit, flute? The symbolism of the flute is that it is hollow. It has no identity. It has only an external covering. And when you have no uh, individual identity of yours, God will blow his breath through you and in what will emerge from that is beautiful music. That's why the flute is the dearest to Krishna because it is an hollow instrument and through that he brings out beautiful melodies which enchant the cows, the gopikas and the gopalas and all the world. Which means that if we are able to make ourselves hollow and be a befitting instrument for God, 
we will be able to contribute so much more in Swami's mission and make our lives more meaningful. So coming to the coming back to sacrifice, Swami used to always say that parents are thinking that I am talking all these high spiritual concepts with the students. They may take to sannyasa and accept orange colored ochre robes. Swami said, do you think it is easy to wear this robe? It is an absolute symbol of sacrifice and surrender. Do you have an iota of that in your lives? Unless you are able to cultivate that, it is of no use. First, at least wear white. Then you can wear orange. What is the symbolism of white? Why we wear white dress? We always wear white because Swami has said uniform, white uniform. But why? Students, uh, YAs and SCC kids here have a habit of asking why for everything. That's what parents keep telling. Anything you tell them, they will say why, why. In a way, it's good. Because at least that way the parents will go back and try to find the answers. Why should we wear white? The white symbolizes purity. You have to wear white and hence you have to be extremely careful that your hands while eating, while walking, you don't make your clothes dirty because so many opportunities for a white cloth to get dirty. Swami used to say, I make you wear white so that you are always careful that your clothes don't get dirty. And you are reminded that just that you are careful that your clothes don't get dirty, you also have to be careful that your character does not get polluted. Just as you are so careful that there is no blemish on your white cloth and it remains fresh and neat, you have to ensure that there is no blemish on the pure character that God has endowed you with. That is the true offering, that is the true sacrifice, that is this true CIA that we need to do. CIA is constant integrated awareness that we always talk about these difficult terms. But the simple meaning of that is this. Another example I'll give and I'll move to the next alphabet because sacrifice was a big thing. I thought I'll elaborate a little more. But how Swami's thoughts are always on others. On one evening, Swami was sitting, the, pre the evening previous to the birthday, Swami was sitting inside the interview room and he was in close contemplation. His eyes were closed, his hands, his uh, fingers were on his cheek, you know, that contemplative pose in which Swami sits. And some students were sitting around. So they thought Swami is in some deep engrossed meditation or he is traveling to some other worlds and giving darshan to devotees and all of that. So usually you sit and enjoy that beautiful moment. After some moments, Swami opened his eyes and then he asked, you were wondering what I was thinking, isn't it? He said, they said, yes, Swami. So Swami said, you know what I was thinking? They said, no, Swami. He said, I was just thinking if all the devotees who have come for my birthday to whom I have distributed saris, whether everybody has got the sari or not. So I was just analyzing whether my devotees have received my prasadam on the eve of my birthday. Every single action, every single opportunity is for others. That is the most important message of Swami. That's why in the Super Speciality Hospital, in the base of Ganesha's big statue in Puttaparthi, in Super Speciality Hospital, how many have gone? Only one auntie, two aunties. Nobody has gone to the Puttaparthi Super Speciality Hospital. Okay, half a dozen or one dozen. Have you seen a big Ganesha statue there? Yeah. What is written below that in big bold alphabets in? Sanskrit, not in English, in Devanagari script. Anybody remembers? Those who know Devanagari script, do you remember? No. Such an important message, which we usually just, we are so enamored by Ganesha that the message is lost. We are so enamored by Swami's physical form that the message is lost. But then the form has come to give only a message. The form will come and go as it has physically gone. But the message will stay for the next several millennia. That is the purpose for which the avatar descends. That is the purpose for which every avatar descended. Krishna's Dwaraka is below the Arabian Sea. But his Bhagavad Gita continues to resonate in every house across the globe, wherever his form is worshipped. That is the case with every avatar. So the message is more important than the master because that is what he has come to give. Below the Ganesha statue is written in big bold letters, Paropakara Artham Idam Shariram. This human body has been given only to serve others. That is the single pointed objective of this human body. And that is the single pointed objective that Swami showed throughout his life as to how he lived only for the sake of others. 
next alphabet of this ship h what does h stand for h stands for humility after doing everything swami will never take credit for whatever he has done if anybody says swami because of your grace i became all right swami will never say yes yes it is my grace which has called cured have you ever read swami taking credit for what he has showered his grace for if we help someone and someone comes and says oh thank you so much you will say yeah, yeah it's okay it's okay because we want to take the do a sense of doership that yes i helped you if someone doesn't come and say thank you then you will feel bad oh my god i did so much they didn't even thank me and to remind others and posterity that you have done so much good to society you will have huge boards everywhere this facility is donated by this building is contributed by in several leading universities of this country even in elevators there are boards this elevator is donated by so while the donors are no longer in this world they want the world to remember that they have done some good by giving an elevator in one business school but swami did everything and never took credit for anything that is the humility which swami embodied do not take credit for anything when the people from anantpur came to thank swami for the fantabulous water supply project that swami did they said swami we are so grateful to you for this opportunity uh, we are so grateful to you for this service project because we have not had water for the last 50 years for the benefit of those who do not know anantpur geologically is in the same category as the districts on the periphery of the thar desert in rajasthan it's an absolute drought prone area and for 50 years the government of india was not able to provide drinking water and swami himself as a small kid living in that particular district knew the problems of that district and we know the story how swami used to go from his brother's brother's house several miles every day to get water for the household and when the neighbor said swami why are you uh, uh, satya why are you doing this you are a student you have to do your job swami used to say the young satya used to say no this is my duty because i am living with my brother's family i should contribute and my sister is in her family way she is expecting a baby it is my job to help the family so when this anantpur citizens the citizens of the district of anantpur came to thank swami swami we are so grateful swami said no 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 you don't have to be grateful to me i am grateful to you for having given me this opportunity to serve you in future also if you have anything that i can do for you please let me know this is a role model you do not thank the society you do not let the society thank you for doing good to them you in turn thank the society because they have given an opportunity to you to serve them because the one who serves is not great the one who receives is great because he is giving an opportunity for the one who serves to give him and hence relieve a sense of guilt that he has that he is not able to do good for the others and the one who serves and the one who receives and the act of service all three are god this is true message of the service and swami's institutions and swami himself embodied this so every aspect of swami's life was one of humility one of extreme lack of doership and i explained how that lack of doership helps with the example of the flute no act is too big i still remember there is this beautiful photograph of a small kid whose hands swami is Uh, uh, Swami is helping him wash his hands. This is in Kodai Canal, and that boy, small boy, is bending down. His hands are like this, and Swami is bending down ne next to him and pouring water on his hands. Now, what is the story behind that? That the, the Narayan Seva was going on, and uh, all of the uh, people were sitting there in in Kodai Canal uh, for Narayan Seva, and this boy was also sitting next to that. Uh, plate which was given for narayan seva but as swami was coming that way to give darshan that path was not very clean so this boy thought that path is not very clean how can swami walk on that so with his own hands he cleared that path so that the little bit of dust and dirt on the ground does not stick to swami's feet and as swami neared him he saw that this boy is clearing the path so that swami can walk closer to that way he immediately and then he was going to eat the prasadam with that hand so immediately swami said asked for a mug of water and he said he bent down he made this small boy wash his hands and then he let him have the prasadam see that is humility what is required for those whom we are serving 
what is required for those who adore me as divinity that was swami's first priority that is the greatest role model that swami has been in terms of being so humble he is so divine but there is no arrogance in him at all he is so divine and there is no sense of doership in him at all and we are so human and we have all sense of arrogance all sense of doership and all desire to get all credit for everything that we do that is the clear distinction that swami has presented before us so that we can learn from him it doesn't make any sense sitting and doing bhajans here going and doing seva every day participating in study circle doing all the activities that the organization provides us a platform if that does not lead to imbibing any of those virtues in our own life because if we are the way we are from the time if we have been so this this was one of the oldest centers in america 42 years old if people who have been a part of this center right from the beginning are not able to assert that there has been a total transformation in their life then the entire effort of the organization providing their platform and their own effort of being here for last four decades is fruitless because the whole objective of being a part of the organization is for transformation swami always used to say i don't want your devotion i want your transformation because it is for that purpose that the organization has been established that's why the first prerequisite in the organization is to enable the members of this organization to realize their latent divinity if that objective is not achieved through the platform which swami's organization is providing then every other activity is superfluous because swami doesn't want us to sing for him we think we are singing bhajans for swami we are not singing bhajans for swami first we are singing bhajans for ourselves because those vibrations will cleanse us and those who have the voice to sing beautiful bhajans are singing for the benefit of other devotees so that by their mellifluous voice and the bhavam the feeling in their voice they will have the inspiration and the love flowing from their hearts towards god that is why we are singing bhajans i already shared why we are doing service why we are doing study circle swadhyayam or self study is a prerequisite of our nine point code of conduct regular study of sai literature but how many of us spend 15 minutes every day to read swami's literature the thought for the day is not sai literature that's just a paragraph regular study of sai literature for 15 minutes every day is a must swami always used to say you eat four times a day and in between so many times tea coffee so i used to say madhyam madhyam pranim samarpayam you do like in puja like that every few hours you want tea coffee and water for yourself your body is getting food 18 10 10 12 15 18 times a day doesn't your mind and soul need to get spiritual nutrition for 15 minutes a day that is the regular literature study if that comes none of the other things will be required because you will automatically be motivated to be connected with god all the time but we go here and we go there and we look for answers everywhere the answers are in our library 39 volumes of satyasai speaks 15 volumes of samashavars 15 vahinis five volumes of my dear students we have as much literature that if we do serious study in our lifetime we will not even complete it and all our doubts will be dissolved these are the 5000 discourses that swami has given he has blown his breath transformed it into words and presented it in front of mankind so that we may benefit from that that is a very important part of our life which must be incorporated whether we do any other sadhana or not we should we need not do meditation we need not do namasmarana we need not do bhajan we need not do seva if we do 15 minutes of swami's reading of literature everything else will automatically fall into place because you will be burning with the desire to do something then automatically you will have the motivation to come for bhajan automatically you will have a burning desire to serve others automatically you will always be alert that what i am doing is in alignment with swami's values it is like the fuel which is going to power the car to reach the destination swami's words will do that job of that gas in the car which has to reach the destination so this is the message of in humility moving to the next message of i which is inspiration there are three kinds of teachers swami used to say one who are always complaining second the ones who are always explaining the third who are always inspiring and to these three categories that swami has given i will add the fourth to which swami belongs because he was talking about humans i'd like to add him in that category and 
add the category of divinity, which is the fourth category, which is those who transform and provide an enabling ecosystem for transformation. That is the role model that Swami has been, that he has provided a platform for all of us to be a part of. Have we ever analyzed the work that Swami has done in his lifetime? I referred this in my Mid-Atlantic region retreat in 2015 May. How many of you were not there for that retreat? 2015 May. Not there. Okay, so rest were there. So rest remember what I have said. Okay, so I'll provide a brief overview to that so that we know what kind of inspiration Swami has provided and how he has been a brilliant role model. But the problem is we have limited Swami to a man of miracles. Anything about Swami? Miracles. Vibhuti, Turmeric, Amrutam, Lingam. This is all that we have equated Swami to. He is a miracle man and that's why we always keep talking about miracles, miracles, miracles. Swami used to say miracles are like the mosquito on the back of an elephant. That's all the role that miracles play in my avataric life. Swami also used to say miracles are like my visiting cards. I always say this. I, used to, I also used to wonder why Swami is talking about miracles as visiting cards. I realized and got the answer when I started giving my own visiting card. You give your visiting card to someone, only you meet them the first time. You meet second time, you have forgotten that you have given a visiting card, you give again. You meet a third time, you want to show off that you are from a top institution, I am in Google, I am in Apple, I am in Harvard, you will again give your visiting card. If you give visiting card every time you meet a person, even though the person knows you, that person will think you have some problem here. But that's exactly what we expect Swami to do. Miracles are his visiting card, so he introduces himself once and says that who in shows to you through your own individual personal experience who he is. Having established that connection and identity who he is, he does not need to keep proving himself again and again and again and again to you that he is divine. Only once is enough. After that, your journey begins. It is only for introduction, only. In India, they say without chamatkar, there is no namaskar. So the Chamatkar's objective is only to enable you to understand that this personality is worthy of veneration because he is divine. Having understood that, then the journey of transformation has to begin from our end. It is not Swami's job to keep showing himself as divine and then we keep complaining, oh, XYZ got this experience, ABC's house getting vibhuti, why am I not having all of that? Swami is not coming in my dreams. Are we doing the work that Swami has placed before us that He should come in our dreams? Swami is not a problem solver. Swami is the Jagat Guru who has provided a clear roadmap for us to achieve. And all of those points are ahead of us. So a brief overview to how Swami has provided inspiration. In 1950s, Swami started an ashram. And for 60 years, Swami showed how an ideal ashram should be run. In the 1960s, Swami started the Satasai Seva organization and for 50 years, Swami showed how an ideal Seva organization should be run. In 1970s, Swami started the Central Trust and for 40 years, He showed how an ideal socio-spiritual trust should be run, how a public welfare trust should be run. In 1980s, Swami started the university and showed for 30 years how an ideal university should be run. In 1990s, Swami started the hospital and for 20 years showed how free healthcare can be provided at the tertiary level. At every level, Swami kept on expanding and doing things which were never done. Concepts of education, which was an integral education, where the heart, hand and head of the students are molded to become good human beings and serve the society, was provided by Swami through a system of education in His university. And in the first convocation, Nani Palkiwala, the, one of the foremost legal luminaries of India, said this is a great experiment of inculcating values in higher studies. Right? Values are difficult to be taught at SSE level. Swami started teaching values at the university level. 20 years later, when the president of India, Dr. Kalam, came for the convocation as chief guest, he said, if people ask me, is values, integration and higher education possible, I have the answer ahead of me. The Sri Satasai Institute of Higher Learning has given an answer. 
but for those 25 years day in and day out swami was providing inspiration to his students to live meaningful lives every single day 20000 of us over the last 40 years have graduated from those institutions and are working in different corners of this world professional work while we also contribute in our own way to further swami's mission the healthcare institutions have we ever analyzed the magnitude of the work swami has done through the healthcare institutions just the two super specialty hospitals in brindavan and prashanti nilayam in the last 25 years have treated 2.5 million outpatients 2.5 million outpatients and performed 400000 surgeries this includes cardiac neuro urology orthopedics uh, your uh, plastic surgery everything and have we ever put a number to this what is the quantum of benefit it has given to society i analyzed this as a researcher to find out what is the benefit to society and swami's hospitals have given a tangible benefit of 10 billion us dollars through these two hospitals in the last 25 years for social welfare that is the kind of work swami has done through the hospitals the water project the four water projects that swami did provided drinking water to 1% of india's population now india is almost the world's most populous country but 1% of india's population is equivalent to the population of countries like israel united arab emirates and bhutan put together so one organization has provided drinking water to all of these put together and it was no surprise then that the world water forum at osaka and mexico said that the satasai water supply projects are one of the top 10 best local action projects where private and public organizations have got together for social welfare so ami redefined all of these things that were never done before education healthcare drinking water and set an example as to how we need to solve problems of the society and think big think at a scale which was never done before giving university education free giving hospital tertiary level health care free giving drinking water supply which is the job of the government absolutely free and then we come back to our organization and we think 150 members here are uh, the flushing sai center and so the organization is after all 150 of us the sat sai organization is is present in 125 countries in 2000 sai centers and i don't have a count of how many are there in india but there are 600000 active workers in india and 400000 in the rest of the world so in his lifetime swami has groomed 1 million active workers to serve the society and we are presumably a part of that 1 million active workers i am not even counting the number of devotees who are several 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 million that is the kind of inspiration swami has provided in his lifetime and that is the institution that we all belong to and through all of this swami never said what to do swami did that's why he gave the mahavakya of leadership to be to do to see and then to tell first you have to be then you have to do yourself then you have to see whether the objectives are being achieved then telling is superfluous but we always want to tell others what to do first whether i do or not is inconsequential that is the kind of upside down approach to leadership that we practice swami always used to say the one who cannot be a good sevak cannot be a good nayak the one who cannot be a good servant cannot be a master the one who is not an ideal follower should not aspire to be a leader and swami showed that in action so when he was a student he went to pushpagiri as a scout and showed silently how a scout should serve the people in the pilgrimage centers swami himself used to go and serve in the narayan seva in his early years every single day shrimati geetaram narrates as a small child how she had seen swami 4 hours 5 hours 6 hours in the heat of puttaparthi 120 125 degrees fahrenheit wearing that robe and with that huge mop of hair on his head bending and straightening bending and straightening serving thousands taking a kerchief wiping his sweat again serving wiping his sweat again serving because he wanted to set an example what needs to be done the affluence and the prosperity which we are surrounded with should not become a blockage in the opportunities to serve the society around us to set an example with swami set by his life if we want to consider swami as our role model it is not just for adoration but it is also for actual implementation
and the last part of my talk is P. Perfection. You sacrifice. You are humble about it. You inspire others with that. And at the end of it, whatever you do is perfect. It is not like elsewhere that non-profit organization, so you can do anything and be done away with it. Swami's institutions are the best example of that. Just because it's a non-profit organization, the hospitals are not like charity hospitals. They are the cleanest and the most well-equipped compared to the best hospitals in the world. And I am not saying that people from this part of the world who have gone there have said. Michael Noble, the grand nephew of the Nobel Foundation which gives the Nobel Prizes, when he went to Puttaparthi, he was so amazed at Swami's institutions that in the developed countries of the world, we do not have such perfect service. And that's why he said we would want the Radio Sai channel to be given gratis, free of cost, so that this message of service can be broadcast all through the world. So Ami did not go out networking, networking with the Nobel Foundation to say you must provide me. Your work will speak for yourself. That perfection in work that we undertake all the time, that is what is going to show to the world what the Satasai organization is all about. So Ami's own personal example also, everything Swami did was perfect. You look at his hair. You look at his robe, you look at his walking style, you look at his talking style, you look at his singing style, you look at everything perfect. Are we perfect in all that we do? Is a question we need to ask. When Swami was cutting his nails, and he was cutting them so deep that his nails were bleeding, then the students who were serving Swami, Swami said, they asked Swami, why are you cutting your nails so deep? Swami said, I am cutting them so deep. Because hundreds of devotees fall on my feet every day to Namaskar. If there are sharp edges to my nails, they will get hurt on their feet and hands. I cannot let that happen. That's why I'm cutting them so deep. This is the level of perfection that Swami practiced. Everything should be perfect. It's a very nice example that I have learned from Swami, which I practice to the best of my abilities wherever I go, which I was not practicing earlier. And this was shared by Srimati Gitaram when she was a small kid. And Swami used to come and stay in their house. The first, very first time when Swami came to their house, and I'm narrating what is already known to show how if we really consider Swami as a role model, we should practice that. When Swami came to their house one of the first times, they had decorated the house, in the, the room in which Swami was staying with all the possible, uh, with the flowers and you know how if Swami, you can just imagine if Swami is going to come and stay in your house, what all you will do. We do so many fabulous things for an altar. If Swami is physically going to come and stay, they did all that. After the uh, night, when in the morning, Gitaram wanted to see how the room is going to be, she went inside to think that if some flowers have fallen down or something that Swami has used, she can take it as prasadam, is what I have heard in our talks, her talks. When she went inside, she was aghast to see that the bed was exactly as it is, as it was laid the previous night. The bathroom was as neat and clean as it was laid for Swami. After having bath and cleaning himself, wiping himself dry, Swami had used the towel to clean the floor of the bathroom so that it is absolutely dry, so that somebody else coming to that bathroom after him does not slip. That is the dharma of a guest. In whichever houses I am invited to as part of Swami's organizational work, I remind myself, I never used to make my own bed after I get up. I never used to be sensitive how the wash basin or the bathing area will be after I get up. But now every time I leave a house, I ensure that to the best of my abilities, the house is the way or the room which I was given or the bathroom that I have used is as close to what it was when I entered. That is the kind of small, small examples that Swami has left behind. Using water. How much water do we utilize? Right? One of uh, Swami's uh, former students who had served Swami physically had come to Boston and he gave a talk in that I must quote this particular example. He used to serve Swami in his residence. And one Swami called him and said, you have not put a tumbler on my wash basin. So he said, Swami, the water is constantly flowing from the tap. So I thought you will not need the tumbler. He said, no, I know water is flowing from the tap, but I want to know how much water I am using. It is only when I have a tumbler next to me will I know how much water is being utilized. This is said by a person who has given drinking water to 1% of India's population. Because he has faced the difficulties of living in two buckets a day when there was no water in the Anantpur district. 
for the rest of his life he has lived in simple means in order to communicate that message and 80% of these things are not known to the devotee world so we see all the grandeur outside we don't know and and because nobody knows swami didn't stop doing those things he continued to do because you do not do things to show others that you are doing you do things because that is the way to live we don't wear a particular set of clothes just because we come to the center we wear a particular set of clothes because that is the way of living irrespective of what others think that is what swami's example and swami's life and swami's message and inspiration is every activity is full of personal example one swami was told by certain devotees that the speakers are not working properly swami we are not able to hear your discourse in the farther end of cycle one thal so if it's a big boss of a big company what he will do a bo boss of a big company feels that oh he is so great and big you can imagine swami he has 1 million active workers in his organization and he has all these entire institutions and he is the sole representative leader of all of that so he could have given all if he gives a chance to serve there will be dozens of people who will run to see whether the speakers at that end of the kulwant hall are working or not the swami didn't do that next day morning during darshan time when the music is on and swami is going around taking letters swami went to the farthest end of kulwant hall as if he is accepting letters giving namaskar and in all four corners of kulwant hall he went smiling receiving letters giving namaskar as if he is giving extra darshan he was actually hearing where the music is being heard or not the speakers are working or not then while going back into the interview room he told the people in the bhajan hall yesterday i was told that the speakers in a particular set of the hall are not working i have myself checked they are not working please have them repaired that is inspiration that is the ideal example that is perfection in everything we do yoga karma su kaushalam the united nations and i gave a talk on yoga sister chia is here i gave a talk in the manhattan sai center on yoga the video is there they will share it we consider yoga as all the exercises that we do and the united nations has so graciously accepted the summer solstice day as the international yoga day and 150 countries in the world celebrated great that's the power of our culture and civilization but we have limited yoga only to the physical exercise which is only one of the eight steps that yoga is all about there are seven other steps of which the first two are most important about which i elaborated in that talk and that is given and that is told by swami himself both in prashnottara vahini that yama and niyama are the prerequisites for liberation and also in a discourse he gave in 1996 to the students of the higher secondary school swami is talking about yama and niyama the prerequisites of liberation to students studying in the middle school you see the level at which swami expects and we talk about simple stories of cows and crows to ssc kids thinking they cannot absorb more than that Swami is giving message about yama and niyama of the ashtanga yoga to kids in middle school that is the level at which swami wants us to progress so yoga karma su kaushala meaning whatever you do should be done as an extremely representative and ideal example one well, last experience and then i will conclude the ideal example of the sports meet program the university puts up such grand programs in sports meet right and after the program everybody used to usually runs to the mandir because swami gives group photographs so that was the tradition for several years so uh, one particular year again everybody ran to mandir for group photographs swami came back from the mandir to the hillview stadium and he saw that everything in the hillview stadium is lying as it is none of the props have been wound up none of the sets have been wound up everything is lying on the ground open and everybody has run to mandir so he came to mandir and he was so upset he said everybody is interested in getting photographs here and acknowledgement for the good work done who will wind up the work in the auditor in the hillview stadium what will devotees think what will outside visitors and parents of students think that these people are very good in putting up programs when sai baba is sitting here but the moment baba moves out of the place everybody wants to run behind him nobody is bothered about the proper conclusion of the work done you must conclude an event and wind up things with the same enthusiasm with which you start things that is perfection in action from that year onwards there was a winding up committee in the sports meet committees we had and the job of that winding committee winding up committee is to stand there and see that everything gets over in time I and mean, everything gets wound up in time after swami leaves that is perfection in action
I'll conclude with one personal experience and then the broad objective of our human life. Five minutes more. And this again, Dr. Suhasini said I should, I should share and so I'm sharing. This is about my own experience of Swami blessing me to do PhD. In 2007, I was blessed by Swami to do my PhD. Swami, uh, I gave a letter to Swami seeking his blessings and he was speaking to me in the bhajan hall. And then he asked me, how much time will you take to do your PhD? I said, Swami, three years. So then he thought for a second or two and then he said, try in two and a half years. I said, okay, Swami, now to finish PhD in two and a half years is quite a task. Those who know the rigor of research and the rigor of the schedule in Prashant Nilayam, we have to participate in everything and study. Here, SSE kids say, in the year of my SAT exam, I will not come for SSE class. Please adjust. There, whether you have SAT exam, MAT exam or CAT exam, you have to go to Mandir, you have to get up for Suprabhatam, you have to do seva activities, you have to do bhajan, you have to do everything. You have to stand in line to use the bathroom, you have to stay with 12 boys in the room. You have to sit on the ground and eat food. No compromise. Because if performance is based on convenience, then there is no perfection in that. In difficult situations, in limited resources, if you are able to excel, that is real performance. That's when you are chiseled to the best capabilities that you possess. So, I said, okay, Swami, with your grace, I'll finish. Swami said, yes, tapaga, tapaga, dandiga ondi. He said, lots of grace is there, you will finish. He blessed me. Two and a half years I had targeted because Swami said, I tried, I finished most of my work in that time and in 2010, in the third year, I submitted my PhD, it got blessed, I still remember when I had submitted my, uh, my pre-final thesis, uh, I just wanted to uh, get Swami's blessing, so Swami had finished Darshan and he came and I didn't even think that I should take Akshatas for Swami to bless the document, uh, Swami was so happy that uh, he had given darshan, so all the students had uh, offered lakshatas to Swami to bless them and from that some of the akshatas had fallen on his lap. So he took the akshatas from his lap and put it on my thesis document and blessed me. I still remember that, that was such an uh, overwhelming moment that if he wants to bless, he doesn't even need to create, he is willing to take that which belongs to him and put it on your thesis because he is happy with you. That year, I completed my defense viva everything. In 2010, November, I got my thesis from Swami's hand. And uh, I was the last degree that Swami gave that year in the convocation. The Prime Minister of India uh, had come for the event. In 2011, April, we know what happened. Swami left. When Swami left, that time I looked back four years and I remembered that Swami had said, after thinking for a few seconds, complete your thesis in two and a half years. Because I completed my thesis in two and a half years, I was able to get the degree from Swami's hands physically. If I would not have completed the thesis in two and a half years, which I would not have because it's not easy to do it, unless Swami commands you specifically, I would have not got the, thesis, uh, the degree from Swami's hand. I would have missed an opportunity of a lifetime. So we really, we, we sometimes have this uh, foolish notion that Swami left and Swami left abruptly and that Swami did not plan his exit. Every step in his journey is planned. Dr. Jeevanandam uh, who gives talks, he once had mentioned, I and he were both speakers in uh, Los Angeles uh, retreat. He said that Swami had told him four years before the super speciality hospital was to be established that four years later there will be a super speciality hospital in Puttaparthi and the first patient to be treated will be a carpenter. Four years before the establishment of super speciality hospital, Swami said who will be the first patient. And then we foolishly say, oh, Swami left early, Swami did not plan his exit, Swami was very unwell. Swami is not unwell, we are unwell mentally. Because we have the audacity to think that the one who does not even miss a blink will not plan his avataric career to perfection. In fact, in 2009, I still remember in that Navratri discourse, Swami gave a discourse on the avatars and how ephemeral avataric life is. He said, whatever work I have to do is over now. The rest will be done by Premasai. This was told by Swami in 2009. That discourse is available in YouTube. Please go and see. There is no work which is incomplete. Every work is done with picture perfection. 
the work which is incomplete is left for us to complete which we don't want to do we only want to sing his glory because we think that in the pursuits of joy that we are indulging in all the time we will get all the pursuits that's why in childhood we aspire for joy through friends in youth we aspire for joy through marriage and relationships in middle age we aspire joy through children and promotions and in old age we aspire for joy by going and joining some spiritual organization joy is not going to come from things of the world swami always used to narrate a story and to the mba boys he had said once one military officer went inside a hotel and said i want chicken masala so the waiter came and said sir do you have a vision problem he said no sir i don't he said how dare you ask me that question i'm a military officer i can shoot a bird from a distance he said then why are you asking me about chicken masala he said because i want it he said come out he took him outside showed a board it was written vegetarian hotel how can you come inside a vegetarian hotel and ask for chicken masala that's why i asked you sir whether you have a vision problem swami said just as it was written outside that hotel vegetarian hotel and you won't get non veg food in that when the soul enters this world it is very clearly told anityam asukham lokam this world is temporary it is anityam and it is asukham it is incapable of giving you joy that's why we keep jumping from one joy to the other because no joy lasts absolutely no joy lasts and that is told to us right from the beginning but the entire life is lived in trying to get joy oh what i didn't get my kids will give me what i didn't achieve my kid we always are looking for another opportunity for getting that joy no joy is permanent so what is the second answer to second part of that observation which krishna gave on the bhagavad gita anityam asukham lokam having realized that the world is temporary and incapable of giving you joy what you should do imam prapya bhajaswamam having realized this think of me focus your life on me make me the center of your lives in one discourse swami gave in the 1980s he said when you are making dal pappu how many are telugu speaking here so you know what is pappu dal right you put dal and salt of equal quantity isn't it no then what is more and what is less salt so lot of pappu and little bit of uppu or salt to taste correct this is what swami said in the discourse swami said by giving equal weightage to worldly life and spiritual life you are making a blunder of making dal with salt and the dal in equal quantity then we'll say oh, okay okay we will have lot of dal and little bit of salt the worldly life is dal and the salt will help us of spirituality to keep us grounded right because we are good people we go to bhajans we do seva we have a good heart we are charitable we are philanthropic so the salt the uppu of spirituality is enough swami said no wrong the dal is your spiritual pursuits and the salt or the uppu is the worldly comforts that are required to sustain your spiritual endeavors because you are born so as not to be born again the sole agenda of the human life is to attain one's divinity and that's why i started with that that you are in a bhavasagara we have lived millions of lifetimes like this doing the same thing that's why adi shankara acharya said na punarapi jananam punarapi maranam punarapi janani jathare shayanam balavasthat krida sakta tarunavasthat taruni sakta vruddhavasthat chinta sakta parame brahmana kopi sakta in childhood you will play in middle age you will want the other gender in old age you will have worries but your thoughts will never go to god and what will happen then punarapi jananam punarapi maranam punarapi janani jatare chayanam you are born again and again and you are renting the womb of another mother for 9 months how much of gratitude you have to give to the mother who is keeping you in her womb for 9 months but the gratitude for mother in this world is in this country and in most countries is on two days mothers day and thanksgiving but that mother gave her blood for 9 months from her own nutrition and her own existence and benefited you by suffering the pain of 22 fractures through delivery how much gratitude needs to be given for an entire lifetime to that mother and that is why shankaracharya adi shankaracharya mentioned that how many more wombs will i rent for giving back gratitude because you have to give an entire life to the mothers 
That's why Swami dedicated all his projects to Isharamma. He always used to say, Isharamma told me I want a small school, so I built school and university. Isharamma told me I want small clinic for women, so I built this entire hospital. Isharamma told me there is no water in Puttaparthi, so I gave water project to Anandpur. Everything is for the mother. Another extremely nice example of how much importance Swami gave to the wishes of the parents. Genuinely good wishes. Not wishes about making money and wishes about being successful in your careers. Those are selfish wishes. Genuine wishes for the benefit of society. That's the first requirement for the children to fulfill for parents. So that is the kind of coming and going, coming and going that we have all the time. So the papu or the dal of life is spirituality which will give nutrition to our soul to conclude this journey. And the uppu or salt is the necessary physical comforts that will help you sustain this spiritual journey that we undertake. That is the core message of Swami's life. This body has been given only for this purpose. There is no other purpose for which this body has been given. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the Sankhya Yoga, Krishna has said, Why Sankhya Yoga? Because numbers. What are the numbers? 24 numbers. Five Jnanendriyas, senses of perception. These are the five senses of perception, five senses of action. Two hands, two legs, your excretory organs, these are five senses of action. Five breaths. Brahmarpanam is a prana, paana, samayuktam, pacham, vinnam, chaturvidam, all five life breaths. Five koshas. And then four inner instruments. Anta Karanas, Manas, Buddhi, Chitta, Ahankara. Manas is your memory. Buddhi is your intellect, which tells you what is right, what is wrong. That distinguishes us from animals. Animals live by instinct. Man lives by intellect. Chitta is your subconscious mind where everything is collected. Last is Ahankara, which is your body identity. We are all the time told by our own self that we are this body, we are this body. These 24 instruments are given to whom? To the soul. The Atma residing inside so that you can use these 24 instruments to attain the Paramatma, which is the 26th instrument. And for this journey, the rest of the chapters of Bhagavad Gita are dedicated to Karma, Bhakti and Jnana Marga. This is the only purpose of life and the only objective for which we have come down. That's why Swami always used to say, you are not physical beings working towards a divine destiny. You are divine beings leading a human existence. Realize your true divine potential and attain the true divine status. That is the real message of Swami's avatarhood. That is the purpose for which this organization is established. And that's the purpose for which Swami has emerged as one of the most outstanding role models. That's what Krishna had said in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. Name parthasti kartavyam trishu loke shukinchana. I have no duty to do in all the three worlds. What do I need to do? I can rest. I'm the boss. But every time I incarnate and set an example for mankind so that human beings can learn my example and rise to my status and become divinity themselves. That is the purpose for which Swami has identified and lived his life as an exemplary role model. And that is the goal that we all need to work towards. I think if we recalibrate our lives in that direction and learn from Swami and imbibe those value systems, those practices, those attributes and those convictions in our life, we too will live up to his expectations and be the role model for the society as he is for all of us. Jai Sai Ram. Sai Ram everyone. Pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet. Happy Diwali to one and all. What an excellent motivational speech by Brother Shashank Shah. We are extremely grateful for you coming here to Flushing today. And in a concise, you know, time, you could deliver what you, the messages you gave, given by Bhagwan to all of us. I think Swami has said. Uh, it's all about self-confidence and self-confidence is not just within you, but it's with the Atma, which is God, which leads to self-sacrifice and that leads to self-realization. And through the journey you shared with Bhagwan, and you were very fortunate and we all are fortunate and we should be all grateful to Bhagwan for sharing those momentous occasions with all of us. Thank you once again and I'd like to thank Dr. Suhasini 
for arranging this program and also to brother chandra for bringing the speaker back to new jersey thank you thank you dianish what a wonderful satsang brother sheshank it was worth the wait for four years thank you again i remember reaching out to him in 2015 and again 2016 but as he said it's always it's swami's time when swami thinks it's the right time for somebody to come to our center he sends them to us so thanks to chandra for initiating this conversation and uh, dr sheshank we really appreciate the wonderful um, satsang filled with light and love of swami's message on this deepavali day and may your light in you never be extinguished <laughs> and may you continue to be the distinguished esteemed speaker that you are and spread this light and love to many many more millions of devotees with swami's blessings and grace we thank you and we uh, like to acknowledge just a small token of appreciation like to request brother malik and brother um uh Manohar Chilara. These are two books that uh, the Satsai Books and Publications Trust has published. Uh, one is my. So there are thirty books that I had worked on while I was in Swami's uh, Publications Division in the university. These are two books. Uh, this is uh, eight of my speeches in Swami's physical presence, uh, part one. And this is uh, so. This is the. Uh, the talk I gave at the Mid Atlantic Region Retreat. I built on that and converted into a book. Uh, i have written that inside this is called divine love the source the path the goal this is available in prashantlim it's available in the tustin bookstore very relevant especially this for the wise i have covered many points which emerged in the retreat and uh, i'm giving this to for the center uh, for the library and uh, there are some more which i'm planning so as more books come in and i'm coming this side i'll be happy to present it please encourage the habit of reading if there is one thing that has helped me in swami's physical absence to not miss him or rather miss him but also benefit uh, i mean uh, fill my heart, heart the void in my heart it is swami's message some people asked me now when i was in rale yesterday uh, why is asked me how do you connect with swami in his physical absence so i said the one thing that i did when swami left i was too emotional to go and sit in the mandir in that void even the the samadhi was not going was not ready there was a wall and i knew behind that wall is swami's physical form buried under the ground it was a very emotionally difficult situation so instead of going to mandir for several weeks i used to go for walks i used to go for walks on the airport road i used to plug in and every day i used to listen to one discourse of swami for one hour and i used to do it in a structured way 15 discourses of the summer course 1990 then 15 discourses of summer course 91 or 15 discourses of a kodaikanal visit so in those walks i felt swami was talking to me swami was giving me his messages in his own voice and that has enabled me to gain so much of clarity about what swami wants us to do what is his true mission there is so much i learned from swami himself the best suggestion or advice or idea i could give to all fellow sai devotees please connect with swami's message given by him in his books if you are telugu speaking and can understand english listen and if you can't read but 15 minutes a day minimum be connected to swami's message that's the solution to all the problems which we have imposed on ourselves saira thank you